in pursuit of health and wisdom. Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Welcome back to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. Today, my guest uh, is an interesting, interesting physician. Uh, his name is Dr. Robert Lufkin. Uh, Dr. Lufkin is a physician. He's a medical school professor at uh, UCLA and USC, focuses on applied science of health, longevity, and consciousness. His story is sort of based on a personal story where he's reversing uh, chronic diseases, transforming his, uh, his own life into uh, something of a much healthier one than he was perhaps destined to from his roadmap in our current uh, approach to medicine. He is currently an adjunct clinical professor of radiology at the USC Keck School of Medicine with an academic focus on applied science of longevity. He is the author of a book called Lies I Taught in Medical School, How Conventional Medicine is Making You Sicker and What You Can Do to Save Your Own Life. Uh, Robert, uh, thanks so much for being on the program. Hey, Buck, I'm a, I'm a fan of your work, and it's a privilege and an honor to be here on your show. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, let's let's get into it. Um, I uh, am fascinated by uh, your book, and I think there is, uh, I'm, I'm guessing I have an idea of kind of what your, your take is. I haven't had a chance to read it, but I did, I did get a chance to go through and, and skim it and get some of the big ideas. But why don't we start with this? This chapter in your life so sort of began because of your own health. And um, what, why don't you talk about what kind of got you interested in sort of looking at medicine in a different way? Yeah, well, I, I, my, my whole career is basically uh, from medical school and residency. I stayed on as, as a medical school professor. So I was sort of the mainline establishment. I wrote, you know, peer-reviewed scientific papers, got millions of dollars of grants from NIH and everything. So I, was, I am the establishment. But then, like, like so many people in this field, they've had an event happen. And what happened to me is I came down with four chronic diseases that I was suddenly diagnosed with. I was still relatively young. I had kids in elementary school and knowing what I knew about medicine, I, you know, I knew it wasn't going to end well. So I, I went to experts in the field and they, they assured me, you know, um, they, they have drugs for this. And I mm-hmm. was prescribed four prescription drugs that I went on and I was told, you know, that I would expect to be on these for the rest of my life. And, um, and you know you can do lifestyle but it, you know basically you're going to be on these drugs and you need to deal with that but we'll be able to control the diseases yeah. and everything like that and that was kind of the 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 event the wake up call that that caused me to kind of out of self interest yeah. look at other other possibilities and other approaches yeah. to this well interesting so so if you don't mind me asking what were those uh, disease processes those chronic disease processes yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 it's funny. These diseases are, um, uh, at the, I thought they were unrelated right. for the most part. And they were basically, one was a type of arthritis called gout uh-huh. that uh, many people are familiar with. Sure. The second was uh, a common disease, hypertension, which right. uh, you know almost half of adult Americans have. Uh, the third was uh, abnormal blood lipids, uh, you know, which yeah. I was prescribed a statin for. Yeah. And then um, the last one was prediabetes. In other words, high blood sugar, insulin yeah. resistance. And uh, I was given a drug for that, too. And my my thinking and, you know, many of my colleagues to this day feel like these diseases are, for the most part, separate. You know, arthritis yes. isn't really linked to hypertension, you know, yeah. you know, it isn't really linked to these other things. And um, but out of self-interest, I began to to dive deeper and question question the advice yeah. that I the advice I was given. Well, and, it, and it's interesting because when you talk about those disease processes, from what I remember from medical school, and obviously it was just some time ago, uh, you're right. I mean, none of these things were taught to us as linked. But I will also say that I don't think people really knew that they were linked in any sort of way. And, and you know, I don't, I don't think that there was um, a real understanding. I think a lot of people, even who my contemporaries who maybe graduated uh, medical school 20 years ago or something like that, uh, we just weren't taught to think about these things as a cohesive disease process. And, and what you're talking about are these separate processes that ultimately, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were looking at uh, some sort of metabolic syndrome, 
right? And That's that correct. is sort of That's the correct. underlying thing. So, so what we were doing is we were looking at these things as oddly enough, like these symptoms, we were looking at each one of these symptoms of metabolic syndrome as an individual disease process rather than being able to back up and say, well, there's one like sort of cohesive disease process that is underlying this entire thing that's going on. Is, is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was certainly the wake up call for me that, um, that instead of treating each one of these things with a separate pill or, you know, in some, some cases surgery even, yeah. that there are other things we can do at a basic root cause underlying level that underlies all these that will reverse these and, yeah. and in many cases eliminate the, the need for pills. And, and that the problem is that thing that we need to do isn't another pill or another surgery. It's just not. It's, it's not yeah. just that. It's it's more fundamental. It's about changing our lifestyle, yep. which which actually is the most powerful thing we can do, at least for these chronic diseases. Now, you know, medicine is great. I mean, you and I both grew up in the medical right. the medical profession where modern medicine is unequaled in you know treating a, a fracture or an automobile accident you know I, I want a blood transfusion i'm going to go to a hospital you know that yeah. kind of thing but these chronic diseases the the things that i had and things like cancer uh things like uh cardiovascular disease uh -huh. strokes heart attacks and alzheimer's disease are all uh, they they don't really respond very well to pills or surgery uh, and I I came to learn that these all have a common metabolic basis that right. we can actually reverse with our lifestyle yeah. and, and I never really appreciated that before yeah no I and I don't remember ever learning anything and and I don't know if you know the answer to this but when did this become because if you if you go across the board now, Certainly, some of the some of the physicians out there will look more in the context of metabolic syndrome when they're looking at patients, and then there's others who really that is not part of their framework. I, do you have a sense of when that shift, even from like the literature, even like in in, in the in the conversation, really happened? Yeah, uh, Gerald Raven uh, from Stanford, who described syndrome X, he initially uh -huh. called it, and then later called it metabolic syndrome, which he also said was basically insulin resistance. Uh -huh. uh, right. He described that in the late 1990s, and uh, and so it's really in the last last 20 years that yeah. it's it's entered our consciousness. It wasn't accepted very much when he first described it because he found that the way to treat metabolic syndrome was to ad adopt a low fat diet which uh, was going against the conventional wisdom at the time and even today which um, yeah. people advocate a low carbohydrate diet i'm sorry a low uh he, he advocated a low carbohydrate diet for the metabolic syndrome, which meant high fats. Yep. And today, even today, um, you know, cardiologists are still recommending a low fat diet, which is high carbohydrates. And that's the carbohydrates that drive the metabolic syndrome. Yeah. So let's, let's dive into, if you don't mind, um, we've talked about, we've alluded to, and even named this disease X, this metabolic syndrome. How would you summarize this disease? If you're, if you're explaining this this syndrome, like the basis, the physiological basis of this to your patients? How do you describe that? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Well, I think it's it's insulin resistance, which is one thing, you, you know, I'm sure you've talked about mm -hmm. with your sure. audience, which is yeah, yeah. the body doesn't respond to insulin as much. It's also driven by inflammation. And and after metabolic syndrome was discovered, there was there were some interesting signaling proteins that were discovered in the basis of longevity, mm -hmm. things like uh, mTOR. Like mTOR, right? And mTOR uh, is a is a metabolic switch that either tells the body to grow when nutrients are present, particularly carbohydrates, or tells the body to repair and turn on autophagy when it's turned off. And it's interesting that when mTOR is turned on in growth mode, um, it not only drives uh, most of the phenotypes of aging, like gray yeah. hair and wrinkles and menopause, but it also drives uh, the chronic diseases that, that I was facing and that 
that statistically most of us will die of the, the ones that I've already mentioned through through hyperfunction. Mm -hmm. So uh, at one level, and it's kind of getting into the weeds, is um, metabolic basic metabolic switches like mTOR is turned on all the time or AMP kinase is turned off, which are which, which are disadvantageous and uh, create disease. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about mTOR because it's an important thing. I've, I've talked about it a little bit. Uh, this is sort of in many ways, I think, um, like a master switch in uh, the metabolic um, system, right, where you're switching between building and then breaking down to your, you know, building, whether that's building muscle, building, you know, multiplying cells, building inflammation, whatever the case may be. And then on the other flip of that, there is the breakdown and uh, maybe the uh, you know, senescence, uh, getting rid of senescent cells, autophagy, those types of things that we also know are important. But curiously, though, like both sides of these are sort of important functions, right? So let's talk about, if you would, sort of the balance between those, uh, those systems and what's ideal and what goes wrong in the system that becomes ultimately metabolic syndrome. Yeah, I, I, I love mTOR, this metabolic yeah. switch, and it wasn't even discovered until after Gerald Raven, it really in the late 90s, early 20th century, it came to be well known. But mTOR is arguably one of the most important signaling proteins in all living things. It's conserved biologically for billions of years. It's present in yeast all the way to humans, which which indicates how important it is in our, in our function for life. Um, but the idea is, to your point, mTOR is, is, it's important to be turned on to drive inflammation, to drive growth. Growth is good in some cases. And, and it's important to be turned off when, when uh, nutrients are not available. And when it's turned off, repair goes in an autophagy. So a healthy situation with mTOR is both sides. We don't want mTOR turned on all the time. We don't want it turned on all, off all the time. But what's happened in modern society is that, um, you know, starting really 12,000 years ago with the our agricultural revolution, when we went from hunter gatherers, where we'd have presumably periods of fasting between mm -hmm. between our feeding to a point where we could cultivate domestic plants and begin growing grains we then made we made grains uh food available more commonly and then fast forward to the 20th yeah. century with refrigeration and today we live in a world of junk food basically most of the food we eat every day is junk food and our stores are filled with junk food mm -hmm. and we eat it all the time most right. people eat you know, several meals. So mTOR basically in, in modern man is, is pegged to this, this one side uh, by the presence of foods and in particular high carbohydrate foods because mTOR is sensitive to carbohydrates. Things like fat don't really affect it. Proteins just a little bit. So mTOR is really a, really a carbohydrate switch in many ways. Yeah. And we're, we're in a world of carbohydrates now. And it's, it's interesting because carbohydrates are the, one of the three macronutrients that we actually don't need to eat right. because our body can, can synthesize them. Right. So in a way, actually, mTOR is a signal, primary signal really is insulin, though. Is that fair? That's right. Right. That's so, right. And insulin is right. primarily signaled by carbohydrates, right. less so fats and proteins. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of things there that I think are really important to understand. And one is that, okay, so if we go back to this framework of balancing the on and off switch in, in a healthy sort of way, uh, a major problem in, in modern society is we're eating all the time, right? Like even, even, if, even if we're not eating, you know, excessive amounts, just the timing of the eating. It's not just calories in, calories out. It's about like when, you know, how often are we eating? Are we ever giving our chance, ourselves a chance for mTOR to be down, to, to down regulated? Are we ever, ever, and then, and then what are we eating specifically that is going to trigger mTOR? So those are the additional framework pieces that we've sort of been ignoring. Correct. Right. That, absolutely right. I mean, mTOR is sensitive to other things like oxygen and mm -hmm. a couple other things, but really the main driver is food and and the main macronutrient of food is carbohydrates. So obviously, um, you know, I'm, it's not, it's not going to take a, a, a genius to figure out that you're an advocate for some level of fasting at some point or, or uh, 
some kind of uh what's your take on that like time restricted feeding all those kinds of things well, uh, <laughs> full disclosure, I was raised, my mom was a dietitian, so I grew up in a household following the food pyramid, and yeah. she said, you know, the best thing you can do is eat many small yep. meals yep. throughout the day, you know, eat six or seven meals a day, that's the healthy route. Well, today I eat six or seven meals a week. Yeah, 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 yeah. So to answer your question, yeah, I believe, for me, fasting is useful, I, my I feel great. My brain's never mm -hmm. been clearer. I, I have one meal a day when my kids come home from school, usually dinner time, and the rest of the day, I you know I have tons of energy. I have more time because I'm not eating breakfast and lunch, and I have more money because I'm not spending on yeah. breakfast and lunch. Yeah, <laughs> and then okay, so like in terms of what you eat, are you an advocate for the say the ketogenic diets? Is that kind of what you're? Um, you know, your, your way of eating would, would be recommended or what you eat yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to frame it as a metabolically healthy diet. Yeah. Uh, it happens to be if you're, if you're fasting, you go into ketosis after right. a period of time. If you uh, avoid carbohydrates, which drive, turn mTOR on into this, into this uh, state, if you avoid carbohydrates in your diet, you will also tend towards ketosis. So um, the diet I use is a ketogenic diet, but I also avoid other things that are pro-inflammatory. Uh, two other two other items I keep out of my diet in addition to refined carbohydrates and sugars. Uh huh. And like what what kinds of things like grains and things like gluten? Um, and yeah, the the mm -hmm. these industrial oils that were developed mm -hmm. in the turn of the century, uh, the turn of the last century, originally as a lubricant for mm -hmm. German submarines, industrial oils. They were later reprocessed as foods, and they're like Crisco and seed oils, like like uh, vegetable oil, canola oil. It, these uh, drive inflammation and. Uh, I avoid those in the foods I eat. And then the third thing is grains. I avoid mm -hmm. also, um, I'm not gluten sensitive. I don't have celiac yeah. disease, but many experts believe that up to 50% of adult Americans are sensitive to gluten or other proteins in grains that drive inflammation. And I, I, I avoid them for that reason. Also grains in the U S are bathed in, uh, a weed killer called uh, glyphosate, yeah. and they also yeah. happen to have a lot of uh, refined or a lot of carbohydrates in them. So I avoid them for all those reasons. Interesting. Do you, when you're looking at these diets, obviously you're, you know, you you've, you've effectively said that when you're fasting, you're going to ketosis anyway. You're obviously trying to maintain that 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 ketosis even when you do eat. There's a lot of different ways that people do this. I mean, um, which. Frankly, I I don't know that much about, but to me, uh, I've always thought about it primarily as a restriction of carbohydrates. Maybe you try to make a line at say fifty grams of carbohydrates per day and and try to like stay below that. But what are there? There's other elements um, to that macronutrient diet that people have advocated for, where it's say ninety percent fats and that kind of thing. What's your take on that? I'm I'm totally curious on that element. Yeah, I mean, for the, the three macronutrients, obviously, mm -hmm. fat, protein, and carbohydrates, right? So what most people do in the diets is they keep the proteins more or less the same. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a teeter-totter kind of switch. If you raise the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. you're going to lower the fat. And that's what modern low-fat diets are that many cardiologists mm -hmm. still recommend. So what I do is the other side, I do a low carbohydrate diet, which keeping the proteins the same raises the fat. So I try and eat healthy fats, which are, you know, not the seed oils, but but the other types of fats. So that's that's kind of the trade off in in the in the way I eat. But it's it's interesting because you know, this, this idea with ketosis being healthful, you know, you can go all the way from um, uh, Chris Palmer and Virginia or Georgia Ede talking about putting psychiatric patients right. on ketogenic diets or epilepsy and, too, right? I mean, or epilepsy too. Yeah. It's been accepted yeah. for you know thousands of years. Works there, but now with Alzheimer's disease, you know, get Dale Bredesen, Heather yeah. Sanderson, and others are putting people 
on ketogenic diets when they go into ketosis, some of the patients, not all of them, but some actually the, the brain fog gets better and their, their minds become clearer. They're using ketogenic diets now for cancer as adjunctive treatments for glioblastoma and other things. And they're getting powerful, powerful results. Uh, cardiovascular, you know, cardiovascular disease, uh, also affects with that all the way all the way on and it's interesting turning mTOR down which which these diets do by going into ketosis has beneficial effects on all of the diseases that i mentioned yeah. already and there's probably multiple you know multiple mechanisms there i mean specifically it's interesting that you bring up the ketosis in alzheimer's disease because i uh, was uh, recently at, at talking to a neurologist friend about this um and wondered about this um uh, why that wasn't something that seemed to be sort of a, you know, sort of automatic in a way, because I think what we're talking about specifically is what people are referring to as type three diabetes right now, which is sort of essentially an insulin resistance at the blood brain barrier, which with ketone bodies, which are uh, the, the byproduct of the ketosis diet, uh, the breakdowns of fats, they don't have to deal with that transport system at the blood brain barrier and therefore they can, you know, they can, they can easily get the, that as an energy source. So it seems like that, and along with some ischemic issues, that that might really be the underlying cause of, of some of the dementias out there. But, but, it is a, yeah. but it is an ongoing process, right? Like uh, in terms of trying to get people to, to, to try to see these issues. So. Yeah, I mean, for Alzheimer's disease, I, I, I think it's a complex disease. It's right. probably not beta amyloid right. you know, as cause. That's probably uh, downstream. Right. Downstream, exactly yeah. right. Uh, and there, it's probably multifactorial. For some people, it's mold. For some, it's Lyme disease. For some, mm -hmm. it's vitamin D. You know, and there are some people, it's parasites. You know, that's multifactorial. But for some people, a large percentage of people, like you say, it's it's uh, glucose metabolism in the brain. And there's a, a, uh, a practitioner who runs runs uh, nursing homes for Alzheimer's patients, Heather Sanderson. She's a Dale Bredesen protege. And one of the things she does in her nursing homes, which are unusual because her nursing homes for, di for Alzheimer's patients actually send patients home at the end. Whereas mm -hmm. for most people, nursing homes for Alzheimer's patients yeah. is a one-way street. You don't check out. Right, you know? right, right. Uh, so I, I, one of the things she does is she puts all her patients in all her nursing homes all on ketogenic diets. And I say, you know, come on, Heather, does that really work? Right, and, right. You know, how do you know? And she goes, well, for some people, it's really obvious, like Mr. Jones, I know he's in ketosis because he recognizes his grandchildren and hugs them and smiles. When he goes out of ketosis, they walk into the room and he, he doesn't even acknowledge them. Right. Interesting. Very interesting. Oh, and it makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, especially if you've got somebody who's sort of at the border of cognitive decline and they're kind of going slightly in, slightly out, just having a little bit of boost of, you know, more metabolic activity in the brain because they're actually able to get those ketone bodies across the blood brain barrier. I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense yeah. why that would be the case. I mean, my Alzheimer's hasn't started yet, knock on wood, but, uh, right. but you know, I, I notice it already when I have a big lunch or I'm, I'm eating carbohydrates and potato chips all day. Oh, my, sure. My brain fog, you know, I'm just not thinking clearly. When I'm fasting, though, uh, you know, my brain is much clearer and I can, I can notice the difference. It's really dramatic. And that's one of the reasons I do it just because I feel so good. So bring this up because I know it's, it's, it's a very flawed study, but I'm sure you people have been asking you about the American Heart Association. Uh, this was a, you know, very large retrospective kind of probably poorly designed, certainly from, uh, or no, I wouldn't say poorly designed, but I would just say uh, a design that provides limited information, but effectively, uh, suggested some correlation to, you know, long-term cardiac death from, um, you know, people who were, who had these, um, who ate in windows of eight hours or less, um, which we called time-restricted feeding, which is a type of a type of fasting that we've been doing. So I'm, I'm curious on your take on that. I mean, certainly that's been a, something that uh, I'm, which didn't come out there because it, it makes me wonder a little bit, even though the data is not strong, but why don't you comment on that? Yeah, that, that's a great thing. This is a, a study that was, um, actually it hasn't come out yet. Right. It was a paper, paper yeah. presented at a scientific meeting, which means there's limited peer review. They, they look at the abstract and accept it or not. So it hasn't 
it hasn't been really been published and undergone the kind of scrutiny that you need. And I think it's I, the the organization that published the headline. I think was being irresponsible and yep. you know premature and making those those kind of claims without without the weight of a scientific paper behind it. Uh, t- but so it's just an abstract. It hasn't come out yet. But I'm going to pay very close attention to it and and. Um, and you know, my mind. You know, I try and keep my mind. You got to keep it open, right? I mean, yeah. here, here's yeah. here's it's curi- curious about your your take on this. First of all, it sounds to me the more and more I learn about it, because it was really hard to glean what ac- exactly what the study was was, because as you said, it wasn't published or peer reviewed or anything. Um, but when I look at something like that, it, it it's important to look at the it, you know a lot of people in the, this space just completely, you know. It's useless. It's a worthless paper. It's complete BS. But I mean, listen, we we've you and I have done uh, a 180 on some of the things that we've learned. We've talked about food pyramids. We've done a 180 on a whole bunch of things. So it's important to constantly be looking at these things and saying, hey, what if it's the case that fasting is a really good intervention to right the ship of metabolic syndrome, but maybe long term people are continuing to do it or some of them are getting sarcopenia effects and dying early. Maybe that's what's going on. I'm not saying that that is what's going on, but I think it's really important to pay attention to what's going on. But what we can say is with, I think, for a fairly high level of confidence that at least in the short term or uh, to get metabolic disease under control, metabolic syndromes under control, fasting clearly has a ton of evidence. Is that a fair yeah, assessment? Yeah, yeah, that's... That's absolutely true. And the, the other the other key point that um, I like to emphasize that a lot of lay people aren't aware of is that there, there are basically two different types of scientific studies. One is a correlati- correlation yeah. study, which looks at associations. Sure. And the other is a causal study, which is a control trial, much more expensive, much more difficult to do, but can, can tease out causality and causations. Mm-hmm. The problem with correlations is you get things like um, People who eat red meat uh, or more red meat is associated with dying of cancer. It is no question about it. Right. But it doesn't mean that red meat causes people to die of cancer. People who drive pickup trucks are more likely to die of cancer than people who drive Priuses. Mm-hmm. And it has nothing to do with their trucks, but it's it's there's some other lifestyle factor in there that's that's causing it. It's just yeah. like red meat probably doesn't cause cancer. And driving a pickup truck doesn't cause cancer, but people who drive pickup trucks and eat red meat may have other behaviors that, that yeah. we don't know about that drive cancer. Yeah, uh, and that and that causality is really really problem. And even you know, I sometimes fall for it. My doctor friends fall for it. You get a headline: such and such causes this, when it was really based on a a correlative paper that's an epidemiological paper which is most most of the evidence we have for nutrition science right yeah absolutely and i mean i think in this one too there was more flaws in it as well i mean it was certainly a survey study uh i think it was started in 2003 when i think a lot of people were not really looking at fasting as an intervention i mean you could have been you know lifestyle related to people who were uh, eating in windows of less than eight hours a day just you know they work too much and they don't have time to eat and is it the stress of the work and eating donuts at, at work you know there's all sorts of things but but it is something worth keeping an eye on i think um let's um let's shift a little bit i'm curious um you know the role of uh, various uh, uh medication supplements uh, obviously, we've talked about mTOR quite a bit, and uh, mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin, um, which rapamycin, of course, then uh, is the drug of choice, right? <laughs> to if if you want to uh, affect this, um, we're gonna talk. We've talked a little bit about it. Maybe if you you know just talk a little bit about the role of rapamycin and and uh, what your take on it is. Yeah, rapamycin is an interesting drug. It's FDA approved. It's used by millions of people. It's it's safe when used at the dose for longevity. There's an off-label use for longevity. Mm-hmm. Um, and rapamycin is interesting because it's a very clean drug. It has one target, yeah. <laughs> mTOR, unlike 
metformin where we, we don't really understand how it works. So yep. rapamycin yep. is a kind of an ideal drug for turning down mTOR. And a lot of people do it with longevity once a week dose um, to, to do that. And the problem is if, if you just rely on mTOR and say, well, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take take uh, rapamycin, just rely on rapamycin, I'm just going to take a pill and ignore lifestyle changes, you're probably missing out on most of the benefits. So my take is, I think rapamycin is very powerful. I take it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, it, it checks all the boxes for all the diseases, but we really don't understand how it works. For example, if you combine M rapamycin with a carbose, which is another mm -hmm. diabetic yeah. drug, you get a significant lifestyle extension in animal models beyond rapamycin itself. You know, so there's there are synergies and complexities that we don't really, really understand yet. We're just beginning yeah. to scrape, scrape, scrape the surface. So why would anyone miss out on the benefits of lifestyle modifications, which are almost certainly going to amplify mm -hmm. the effects of rapamycin? So my, my own take is that I would not take rapamycin by itself. I would only take it in the setting of a comprehensive lifestyle mm -hmm. program to, to optimize everything else. If you believe in it enough to take rapamycin, you ought to be optimizing your lifestyle as well. Right. Well, let's talk about lifestyle as an intervention, because I think, you know, uh, all, each one of these things, whether it's diet or exercise, uh, we've talked about diet already. But exercise itself, I think you could look at as an intervention in much the same way as you could look at a, you know, any sort of pharmaceutical, right? And might be one of the most powerful, uh, probably the most powerful, uh, um, you know, intervention that you can do. And, and if, if you gave anybody a drug and said it had this, this benefit and this benefit, Definitely everybody be on the truck, right? <laughs> so so when you talk about exercise, I mean actually you're not telling people just okay, go home and exercise, right? What 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 kind of exercise are you advocating for or what have you seen in the research to suggest that it it helps with specifically with longevity and metabolic syndrome? Yeah, well, um, one thing to just to clarify one point, uh, I I would I would say, I would disagree that exercise is the most important lifestyle thing. I believe that nutrition is yeah. that of the of the numbers. Just in my opinion, if you're going to do one thing, do nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree, exercise is super important and it can't be overlooked. And so, for exercise, we can we can look at uh, two kinds: mental and physical exercise. Mm -hmm. and the mental exercise can be you know, learning a new language, playing the piano, staying fresh like that. And there's, there's evidence, there's, there's amazing studies that the part of the brain, one of the most plastic part of the brain is the hippocampus. It's a part of the brain that memories are stored in. Mm -hmm. That's when, when people with Alzheimer's disease that the hippocampus gets smaller. And you can actually see it on a on an MR scan of the brain. Uh, you can see the hippocampus. You can see how big it is, how small it is. But there have been some fascinating studies, both with um, mental exercise and with physical exercise, where you it's possible to change the size of the hippocampus. In other words, reverse the hippocampal atrophy and actually make it grow, presumably through you know uh, effects on things like BDNF, brain-derived mm -hmm. neurotropic factor, and other things. But these, this can be exquisitely influenced by both mental and physical exercise. So that was, that was, uh, that was good. The, the other new thing about exercise I wasn't aware of, but, it, but I should have suspected it, like, because like most things, you know, too little is bad, but also too much is bad. And, yeah. and you think of too much exercise, well, I'll sprain my muscles or, yeah. I'll, you know, I'll get a blister or something. But actually, there's a there's a much darker side to that that's appearing now with things yeah. like with hyper hyper functioning athletes, extreme ultra athletes. They're getting marathoners, like ultra marathoners, right? <laughs> yeah, cardiac right, calcium scores right, with right. actual high calcium. But that may be just that may be spurious, you know, just like you get high calcium with statins and everything. But actually, the darker side is they're they're finding myocardial fibrosis mm -hmm. and um, permanent changes on that. So that was that was interesting. So just like with with sleep, there's probably a sweet spot in the middle, and too little and too bad, too much is bad yeah. with exercise. It's yeah, sort of the Goldilocks zone of, of exercise is kind of what I've what I've kind of called it too. And it it's um, yeah, you find the ultra marathoners and all that, and even bodybuilders, by the way, right? I mean, bodybuilders have got that issue. Um, 
you know, and, and you, you got to wonder if that has something to do with the, 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 uh, mTOR effect They're Obviously they're in massive, uh, you know, building all the time and, and the mTOR, uh, you know, the mTOR, uh, needs to be uh, on, uh, in order for them to grow big muscles. Right. So, so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious on your take on that because as a guy who's starting to lift a lot of weights, it's like I'm torn. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting question. Right. Uh, yeah, as you get, because uh, what I'm learning is that there, we all have, you know, we can all optimize certain things about our body and our, right. and our behavior. And we can, uh, you can optimize performance to right. be really good at a sport or an event. And, it, you know, yeah. but optimizing performance is different than optimizing For longevity. longevity. Right. And sometimes it's even a trade off. <laughs> you, know, yeah, yeah. You, you may want to optimize performance, build up, do a lot of testosterone, bodybuilding, uh, but that may, you know, there may be other effects down the road. So uh, opti- you have to ask yourself, am I going to optimize for performance or am I going to optimize for longevity? At this point in my life, I'm optimizing for right, longevity. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, and it, yeah, it, it is an interesting too. I mean, like, again, it's um, like it's one thing to look at thing in the, things in the lab and then it's another thing to look at it, the humans. I mean, for example, I think muscle mass is very, very important for humans, right? So like I think that sort of um that additional of effect is uh it's it's hard to figure out what the right balance is like how much muscle lean muscle mass should you have versus you know um you know try to suppress uh mTOR you know for example i feel like those are kind of they're sort of like theoretically sort of on the different sides of of the uh, the spectrum. And so how do you, you know, kind of balance yeah. that? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I, when I began looking at rapamycin and mTOR, one of the big concerns is, you know, as you get older, sarcopenia, right. muscle mass is, is a, is a morbidity and yes. a contributor to death. So you don't want to do any drug that is going to accelerate muscle loss. So yes. in mTOR, if you're turning it from hyperfunction down to repair, what does that do to muscle mass? Well, fortunately, for whatever reason, there. It, it, they're not seeing a big muscle mass uh, loss with uh, rapamycin. So it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't appear to contribute to sarcopenia. Now, does that mean that bodybuilders, it may, it may slow down muscle uh, accumulation. So, right. you know, I don't know the evidence on that. But as far as regular people like me who don't want to <laughs> lose muscle mass, right. at least the evidence I've read, the, sto- the reports I've read suggest that that's not it's not the problem yeah yeah well anyway so this is um this has been really fun uh, robert i don't want to take up too much of your time i uh but it is uh really fascinating stuff i appreciate the work you're doing here the book again is uh lies i taught in medical school how conventional medicine is making you sicker and what you can do to save your own life you also have your own podcast what is that called it's called uh, the Health Longevity Secret Show, and I hope you will be joining me on. It oh, I'd love shortly. to. That'd be great. Yeah, we're going to yeah. get you on in, and then we could, like, you do the talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. We can hear about you. Our audience can hear about you. I'm looking forward to it. Great. Thank you so much, um, Robert, and love to have you on the show again. And uh, have a good day. Thanks so much, Buck. Thanks for having me, and thanks for all the great work you do. Thanks for listening to Sapio with Buck Joffrey. A quick reminder that while I am, in fact, a surgeon, nothing I say should be construed as medical advice. Now, make sure to include your physician in any medical decisions you make. And also, if you're enjoying the show, please make sure to show your support with a like, share, or subscribe. Until next time, this is Buck Joffrey for Sapio with Buck Joffrey.